Down from the hills within the flow of weekend traffic, disguised in nondescript pensioner car, hat and a grey beard. Fuel gauge is on half and the temperature stable. I have plastic picture cards and identity papers to prove I am me from an employed existence, law-abiding citizen with intended destination. I park under, behind and around hidden parking lot corner, adopt the self-imposed exile of my public persona, barefoot paddling, invisible to gaze of fashion pedestrians. I leave no social carbon footprint behind me, reassuring smile at odd job sheep who sense me near them, just a wolf prowling in castaway clothing, nothing to fear. A craving for salt draws me up concrete, inclined to where tourist attractions crowd in for a dollar. Step behind tree to survey the surroundings for blue uniforms, sad people with badges. Plot path ahead, so undercover, lone wolf, shadow quickly loping through signage, clearly stating that there are no dogs allowed. Sand grating under stride is sound of rasping cricket chorus backed by rhythm of waves from the ocean breathing, screaming of gulls, happy kids in a fairground, bikini babble about a bronzed testosterone ritual. Adjust my hearing so can hear bubbles of foamy water turbulently washing around lone figure paddling towards the headland at beach's end. The bluff is beset by seals riding surfboards, lolly-papered coloured tourists climbing steep-stepped barrier trails, young trendy backpackers taking selfies with phone cameras, pensioners talking glibly about their sunburnt cancers. Leaving the sand to escape community chaos, vanish into bushy street culvert that had once held the purest water for cliffs beyond. Leaping over stagnant memory of plants and animals drinking, momentum and claws scrabbling, getting me up the far bank, follow animal trails, sounds of waves smashing rocks to precipitous path along the cliff edge, wind coming up, pebbles rolling down, as wolf stalking cautiously towards headland's highest vantage point. Reclining into rock face, I breathe deeply. Picturesque panorama vista does not do the view justice when picture this sounds, shapes, colours beyond human imagination. Earth, sky and water, fluid, Salvador, Dalian landscapes magically metamorphizing into mind melting mark charge. An artwork so intelligently interactive it stimulates my brain provocatively, all my senses vying for attention. Opening my eyes, ears, mouth, mind, heart and soul, I let it all in through and flow all around me. Static of my disconnection with the planet subsides, not thinking, just floating, mentally outward, not seeking to understand explanations, just enjoying and feeling, absorbing with reverence, endless energy there. On walk back, I count unbroken seashells. I have no need to collect them. They just could create clutter or be someone else's thrill. I'll be ground up into sand, redirecting pounding water, eroding the headlands into the ocean, creating new homes for seashells, continuing connected complex cycles, the creation destruction that is Earth. Between safe swim flags, now a red yellow carnival, fairground is littered with sunglass dealers, deros and junkies. Uniforms of vigilantes are tagging loose feral hippies. Consumers fill pavement with turtle choking plastic. Gutters run straight into the ocean, carrying fetal, chemical, heavy metal, ice cream concoctions, two dolphins crying for humanity's soul. I will not cry. I will howl out with rage about false human image imposed on our coastal shore, growling loudly at the poor sheep so misguided to think beaches, nice coastal haven, when urbanisation destroys natural cycles, defacing the picture supposedly enjoyed through postcards printed yesterday before damage done by us all. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. Vince Stead. And uh, 
For those of you who came in late, this is a poet's breakfast as part of the Aquarius 50 anniversary. And someone else who was there back in 1973 from over the coast, please give a welcome to Robert Gibson. Robert. I'm talking about the universe, people. Universe people drink peppermint tea. They give flowers to riot police. Smoke, they smoke pot occasionally. They shower with a friend to save precious water. They make love, not war. And they protest the slaughter of oppressed peoples and minky whales in the sea. They cry for the rivers and they bleed for the trees. Down to earth, universe people like me and you. And whatever country they be living in, universe people are world citizens. Different culture, different places, different customs, different races. In the lowland or on the mountain high, they're all, we're all just standing on the ground, looking up to only one sky. Our universe people are too loose for yoga. They honor the body, they don't want to control it. No guru, no method, no dogma, no creed. The here and the now is all that they need. Rainbow warrior, organic farmer, he is a prince and she is a charmer. Like some terrestrial Sita with her god king Karma, her god king Rama, Universe people are, are too cruel for karma. The universe people live their life by the stars. They've got their moon in the seventh house. They've got Jupiter aligned with Mars. And one thing they're sure of, the Southern Cross, is a constellation. It's not a call to arms. It belongs to no one nation. It's not some brand of body art. Don't make it a symbol to set the world apart. Don't be a country with a desert for a heart. So, look up, come on. It's a handful of far-flung suns. Look up, come on. Join the universe, people. We are already one. Yay. Thank you, Robert. Robert Gibson, our one and only poetry duo of the uh, morning, unless another one turns up. From Nimbin, please welcome Tango and Possum. Did you do this on one mic? Yep, we'll do it. I bet none of you got up this morning and looked in the mirror and went, geez, I'm going to have a good hair day. We've all got hair issues. My hair. My hair. My Pocahontas hair has attitude. My mop, my mane, my smooth horse's tail. My hair has history. Short, cut, cut, long, skinned, bleached, blonde, Purple, blonde, blonde and henned. My hair should be caught and corralled. Caught Always and corralled. corralled. Appears in cooking. Makes mats on the carpet. Cooking on the bathroom carpet. Floors. Bathroom Rock floors. floors. Vacuum cleaners. Vacuum hangs cleaners. like drift nets under, under the deck. deck. Stuff soft toys. My hair, no, my hair has opinions, hates the wind, rebels in the ocean, sings in rainwater, looks good on a limited budget, and avoids hairdressers. My hair, you hairdressers, who cares what you think about my lank hair, my split ends, my dang hair, my mad hair. Bet you're jealous of my long hair. But hands off and scissors away from my hair. The length, the colour, the style, or not, my business, my hair. And my hair runs the show. Demands shirt. attention. Woven into cloth. Knitted into garments. Sewn into quilts. Rolled into cigarettes. Made into jewellery. Used in spells. My hair. Sometimes.
sometimes shaved slippery, or dreaded. Sometimes shaved, never, never dreaded. Never ever dreaded. Never ever dreaded. But <laughs> waxed, oiled, moose, styled, ribboned, braided, plaited, decorated, and, and crowned. crowned. My, My hair has an independent life and tries to strangle me at night. Thank you. The two and only Tango and Possum, thank you. Um, we have some other names on the list, so I'll keep going around. I'd hope, I thought I was gonna be standing here doing two and a half hours of poetry. <laughs> Poets keep coming up. Please welcome next a poem from Colin. Colin, come on down. Hello. Hello. Um, many of the sensibilities of this place from 50 years ago drew inspiration and delight from cultures and places uh, just a little way to the north of here. Um, brought some of those ideas and feelings and uh, appreciation of beauty back to here whilst they were quickly changing just to the north. <coughs> Tourist craziness, chopping wood, carrying water. This poem was written about 30 years ago, so it's um, infrequently I pull it out. Tourist craziness running in my brain. Hello, mister. Where you go, mister? I love you. 3,000 times a day and not enough Bahasa to say. I'm tired now. Please let me go on my way in peace. As was the peace and stillness of the unknown night, humbly displaying heaven's jewels to a whole hemisphere at once in silent splendour. No heed nor need of man's amplified words. Turista, turista, the words scream now, my inattention drawing a harsh, honest anger. From children in a family of ten, weaving straw mats and ploughing the paddocks of father, grandfather and beyond. Children running through the ages of eternity, feet on the earth, hands on nature. Minds in meditation of weft and of the plough, of the wonders of the universe. Now leaping in unison to, what's your name, mister? Tomorrow riding free, uh, tomorrow riding alone, free, into the corporation contrived individuality of Sun Silk and Honda. For the world turns to a new tune now, a new world order of noise and trash made possible by Sony and Polytechnic Plastic International creating and leading to the void where family and culture are torn apart by TV, material fanaticism and economic rationalism so that the satisfaction of we need can be replaced by the profits and greed of I want. And all, the J and all the J curves turning towards the zenith, screaming, more, faster, everything, now. Grow, consume, multiply, fill Suzuki's test tubes today. The cries of hello, mister, tourista, fading now to the softness of children laughing. The party fly and sound their warning song calling all Allah's children to prayer. The science fiction of the future is happening now. Apply the meditation of the weft and of the plough to the realms of need and want and of when and of, of how. Thanks, Colin. Please welcome back up to the microphone another poem from Jan Mulcahy. Jan, come on down. Well, we haven't had too many cat poems this morning, and I'm going to fill you in. <laughs> My green-eyed cat <clears throat> picked 
up in January 2015 at the local animal creche on the day Charlie Hebdo died in Paris. My cat Charlie went to live with cousin Kate and Dora for a year until the day she claimed my lap at Kate's kitchen table. That night, Charlie crept into the guest room, made it onto my bed and purred loudly. New Year 2017, Kate flew to New York for a week. Dora visited to sleep secretly in the shed at night, symmetrically designed, one white leg, one black, slim as a greyhound, elegant as a fashion model. Dora climbed my, my bare trees, walked on my roof, and at midnight in the snow demanded entry at my window to dry out on my bed. In contrast, Charlie is all black, white and ginger splotches, like a badly designed tabby tiger with a very pretty face. Her calm green eyes glow behind black eyeliner. Her short, stumpy legs and sagging belly give the appearance of a frumpy little housewife. And she sleeps every night near my feet. On the third day of her visit, as I sat at my computer, Dora leapt onto my lap, kneaded my chest, purred loudly, and went to sleep. I swear I did not touch her. Ten minutes later, Charlie showed up, doubled in size, gave a horrified look and spat. Later that day, Charlie refused my lap, refused food, and took up Dora's spot on my bed with green glowing eyes. I'm going to recite the, the first poem from my book, Out of the Blue. The Blue Kingfisher. On the fringe of time, from an island of night, before sun breaks another day, breaks the wall of dreams, a blood moon sets into calm, the fields of green open. Time. My time is running away. My days here, my love, my time with her is gold. People are falling away, falling leaves, fading trees. Ink runs off the page, as blue as a memory a once seen blue kingfisher, once only, then gone. Day breaks. Oh. <laughs> I speak a language that wasn't ground between stones and baked in desert heat not risen from this land like the mist that rises from her forests. I speak a foreign language from a distant land, blown by the blameless wind to these unwitting shores, transported in strangers, invaders, who pitched their tents on bitigal land, not knowing it's dreaming, cast their eyes over storied night skies not seeing any meaning, not knowing this land of mystics, of stories older than old, where earth and sky dance together through time and season, singing feet to old location, dance all night in celebration. I speak words like musket, smallpox, chains and jailing, theft, of children, heartbroken wailing. Attempted genocide, 
failing. And I remind myself, we went to schools without windows whose walls conspired to keep the light from pupils that buried the truth next to the bodies of those who died fighting for their country, lest we remember, lest we remember. Yeah, well, you're talking about Mount Warning. Well, uh, Mount Warning was named by Lieutenant Cook before he became Captain Cook. And uh, my dad uh, uh, selected one of the last nine of the properties uh, at Mount Burrell, which is about 12 kilometres from here. And, uh, of course, uh, as kids growing up, he was 1920, he, he was 23 years old when he, the selections were in 1923 and didn't get married till he's 41. And, uh, of course, after we, we come along, us rotten kids, uh, our job was to pick up the rocks that were spewed out by Mount Warning, uh, which reached down as far as Byron Bay and went up as far as Ipswich in Queensland. It was quite a massive volcano here that we, we live in. And, uh, of course, what we had to do was pick up the rocks and make uh, little fences around the gardens and that type of thing. But my brother Bill, he was a bit of a show-off. He was had a sort of chesty, strong little bugger sort of thing. And, you know, we'd pick up the rocks or stones, but he, we had this massive rock, that, as you probably see, uh, under Mount Burrell there sort of thing. And he, he was pushing on the rock and it came back, slipped back and uh, uh, landed on top of him and all that was left was, we could, was his head was sticking out. So what we did, we told Dad that what happened, he went and he harnessed the draft horses. We didn't have a tractor back then. Harnessed the draft horses, hooked on the uh, mulberry plough and uh, ploughed a couple of furrows down the bottom of the rock so we could shovel the soil under the rock to stop it rolling any further and then on the top of the rock I uh, ploughed a couple of more furrows so that we could sort of dig it down to try to get Bill out. And of course it took about nine hours to get him out with, because of the, um, the amount of time that we, we didn't want to disturb the rock. And the only way we'd get water to him, we had a, one of them uh, shoe last, you know, a long shoe last, and we'd dribble the water down into his mouth and he'd have a little bit of a sip every 20 minutes or so. But when we got him out, his chest was actually crushed. It was that, that wide, it was, it was like uh, keys on a steel frame piano sort of thing. But of course we were so isolated back then we couldn't get to the doctor for a fortnight, but, but Bill survived anyway and his chest was that wide that he couldn't roll over in bed because uh, of the, the width of his, his body. And of course, um, yeah, even a single sheet wouldn't cover his chest. But because we were so isolated, uh, Mum and Dad decided to send us to a boarding school, which was Woodlawn, you know, out here, Woodlawn, St John's College, Woodlawn. Yep. And, and Bill always was a, a, a great swimmer. And of course, because of his chest was so wide, and when he jumped off the uh, starting blocks, he actually glided half the length of the swimming pool before hitting the water. And, one, and of course, like I said, he was always aggressive. But on this particular day, he dived off with such force that he missed the water and ended up got caught, caught in the wire chain around the swimming pool. But, but he, was, um, he, he always won his um, uh, 100 metre races because with the wind behind him, it was like a sail. But if it was a headwind coming back onto him, well, he could run all day, but he always end up back where he started. <laughs> of course, Woodlawn was a very sporting school. We did boxing, football, golf, swimming, uh, cricket, tennis, you name it. But because of the width of Bill's uh, chest in boxing and that, his right arm wouldn't, wasn't long enough to go to the left side of his body and vice versa. And of course, he, he was an all right boxer, but he got into a clinch and every time he went to uppercut, uppercut his opponent, he'd always job himself and knock himself out. But anyway, one, one day when he was um, walking past the, uh, the golf course, 
a stray golf ball hit him in the chest and made the uh, musical sound of the key of C. And another hit him the key of D, another hit him the key of G. And we told our music teacher and she got quite interested in it and Bill could actually, when he breathed in, he could he could fill his left lung up with the air and leave his right lung empty and vice versa. So much that he could hit the high and low notes and the sharps and the flats. So then, and anyway, at the end of the year, we'd always have a, you know, get together at Woodlawn and uh, of course, <clears throat> our music teacher, she was, uh, got a little bit crook, so she got Bill and uh, laid him over to school desks and with a couple of short and pick handles we played Jingle Bellas and it's on his chest. But um, when Bill left school he got a job with the Sydney Sympathy Orchestra but um, he wasn't too popular even though he's a good singer and whatever but they thought because of the width of his chest he was part of the curtains on the stage. <laughs> But uh, at any rate, Bill got married and him and his wife had four kids and they never needed a pram because he could take two kids on each side, arm like that. But Bill passed away five years ago, God bless his soul, and when they did it, we, his wife donated his body to musical research. And uh, when they did the autopsy, they thought he had three pacemakers, but they were the three golf, lost golf balls. I thought you'd be interested in that. <laughs>